Hi, David. Hello. Thank you for agreeing to come on the Challenging University podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, this is quite nice because this time round, I'm recording you. Last time we met, <laughs> you were recording me. Absolutely, yeah. So it for was the fun. It was fun. It was fun. Um, <laughs> so for the listeners today and the listeners to come, could you please share your full name and what it is that you do for a job today? So my name is David Stubbins and um, I am a freelance, I kind of say I'm a freelance cameraman, um, but within that, that incorporates directing and a lot of produ- producing work actually. And um, I also edit, although over the years, I've kind of gone off that bit. I prefer to be out and about meeting people. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. And very briefly, because that sounds like, you know, that's a kind of broad, you could be a cameraman, editor, producer in all sorts of spheres. Where do you kind of focus your work, if you do have a focus? Yeah, so... Um, bit of background I've been doing this 24 years now um and up until COVID I worked for a production company Mm -hmm. um we traveled I think when we first met I may have mentioned this a few years back so at that point we were traveling all over the world filming all kinds of things um Mm -hmm. destination films and films for huge hotel chains and things like that obviously COVID stopped all that um and so i went freelance in 21 and i say luckily um for me i built up some good relationships with other freelancers who we'd used over the years um and so i i worked predominantly over the last two years in news sports um i got to do with football championship football for people who are interested in that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so kind of across the north um yeah but i live in hull so i specifically do hull city yeah. and when they're not at home i get put on other games um for the kind of the northern championship teams i also do the rugby league for sky sports again predominantly in the north although yeah. um this season uh just gone i think london broncos have come back into the uh super league so we might be having a few trips down to london so at the minute, it's predominantly um, across the north. A lot of my work is is based, um, and then obviously sorry, the cat. <laughs> I'm so sorry. First, first cat on the podcast. Sorry, sorry. And it's a black is it? Cat. Oh, it's she lucky. will. Yeah, she gets lucky. everywhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then I do a lot of work for things like BBC Breakfast. So that can be, again, you can be sent anywhere for that. Um, what if they're doing a live OB from somewhere? Um, yeah. So. Great. And I know what OB means, but uh, let's, you know, let's deal with our acronyms. OB is? Sorry, an outside broadcast. Yeah. So um, when you see, yeah. So if you see, you know, a live cameraman somewhere. Yeah. He will be there with his presenter and a producer probably. Uh, That's an outside broadcast. Yeah. Great. Um, Yeah. Sorry about that. (laughs) So let's go back um, in time a little bit. Uh, every guest that comes on, I ask them what their memories of secondary school are. Were you there sure. as a roving reporter? <laughs> <laughs> um, that is where my um, interest in film kind of came to the fore, really. I had, um, I loved school. I absolutely loved being at secondary school. Um, I just yeah, I think it was when when uh, you know when we spoke and um, I saw this question come up. I just remember school being fun. It was just a really good laugh, mm-hmm. but I did. I think I did get my head down and um, yeah. concentrated and and tried to do as best as I could at school. Um, but yeah, we just we just tried to make it as fun as possible. I think, and I think I'm lucky that the school I was at didn't mind that. Do you know what I mean? It was never like I don't know. It wasn't a very strict. It was a Roman Catholic school. Um, but it wasn't a very strict school as such. It was, um, I was very sporty as well. I did a lot of sports there. Um, but yeah, I just, yeah, I looked something as well. It was a really fun environment, really. And was it, um, because I, I know people that will, um, who are not practicing Catholics that will seek out 
the local Catholic school because often they, I was, so I've been told, produce better results. Um, was there a story behind why you ended up at a Roman Catholic school? I think pretty much everyone in my family went to that school. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we had the, the secondary, the primary school, which is like the feeder school into the secondary school, were both Roman Catholic. Yeah. I'm yeah. not just I'm not a practicing Catholic at all now um and to be honest we weren't really back then you know we, mm. we didn't really go to church um my grandma was probably the most religious in the family and even she wasn't that religious <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah it's just you know we just we just it was the closest secondary school to us to be fair uh, yeah uh, um, a great school uh, I've got no kind of uh, now now it's um, I think it's they classed as open faith schools. I think you know because I have mm. I have Muslim family members. They they attend that school. Mm, um, okay. I, it's it's accepting of all religions. I think now it's not. Yeah. I think it's known as a Roman Catholic school, but it's an open faith school. I think might be how it's classed. Okay. Yeah. I just it's mm. it's it's interesting because only something that I learned with schooling around where I live with a lot of village schools they are often church schools because the land was donated by the church so our local all of our uh, local okay. primaries bar one i think are C of E because they're built on church land fun fact right okay <laughs> never knew that yeah it could be that, yeah <laughs> i know we had we had um the school close by used to be the marist family lots of priests and nuns in hull yeah ah, <laughs> so, okay yeah right. um the marist fathers used to be based just down the road right. um, so my when my when my mum and my aunties and my uncles yeah. were all at that school it was all nuns and priests ran it yeah, yeah. um I still remember in primary school the headmistress was a nun and she would just come and interrupt any lesson she felt and she'd just come and play guitar and sing songs <laughs> in the middle of a science in the middle of a science lesson she'd just kind of come in gather everyone around to the carpet play a song and then disappear to the next class and disrupt their <laughs> class and then we just we just get back on with with our class it's, it's really bizarre but um it's great so when the headmistress turns up you're not afraid you're going to be told off you're like it's it's circle and singing time <laughs> yeah 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 she was she was quite nice actually she was quite a nice um headmistress yeah but, but yeah i mean there are stories of much stricter times in those schools yeah, yeah. i think luckily we passed that you're right um <laughs> yeah and what what did you focus on? So at secondary school, did you have the opportunity to pursue your creative interests or were you led down a specific academic route? Or Yeah, so it sounds really boring. I don't know where I even got this idea from because none of my family do this, but I always thought I'd have a nice office job, wear a suit. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I'd probably end up being like an accountant or something. I have no idea why because none of my family are accountants. Yeah. It's just... My head was, you know, get get a nice office job, wear a suit. That's yeah. what you do to make money and progress. Yeah. Like I said, none of my family do that. My granddad was a docker. Yeah. Most of my family are kind of manual yeah. jobs, you know, that kind of sector. Um, yeah. I, I just had it in my head. And now I – and then when, when, I, when I met my careers advisor, I, want, I just wanted to be a pilot. I wanted okay. to be in the RAF. Yeah. Because I had two wow. uncles – two uncles on my dad's side who were – I think engineers in the RAF. Yeah. Um, and my mum kind of pushed me to do that. But she was like, you know, really into that. Mm. And then when I went to my career advisor, they just said, no, you won't, you won't get that. That's, um, they said, <laughs> you, you need really good physics. You need really good physics to be a pilot and you don't have good physics. Um... So um, they just said, um, yeah, what else do you want to do? Mm. And at that time I was into sports and I was running. And so we yeah. kind of looked at being a, um, been a coach actually been an yeah. athletics coach yeah but then once I got into sixth form that I just didn't fancy that either and that's when I'd started to get more into writing um, and journalism um and then yeah so this so where I am now sorry this didn't there was no idea of this in secondary school really it was I was quite quite sporty um I thought I'd either be into sport or like I say I wanted to join the RAF yeah. This didn't kind of. It's Sorry. really interesting. What did you study at sixth form? So 
again, and I don't think Six Honda like this now, but I went on holiday with my friend's family. And so I started Six Form a week after after everyone else. Okay. And this was still at, this was still at the secondary school, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And so I wanted to do geography, but that class was full. Okay. So I couldn't do geography. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, they couldn't squeeze another chair in. Um, yeah. So, and sorry, history that was. I went to history that was full. Yeah. So I did geography. Yeah. I did English literature. I loved yeah. English. I still, you know, I loved reading. Still do. Yeah. Um, and then the only, the next possible thing that I could do was Christian theology. Which, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. I think it was either that or. I don't know, probably French or something, you know, where they only had space to push me to somewhere else for a third course. Wow. Um, and we did general studies as well. So I did yeah. Christian theology, English right. literature and yeah. geography. Right. And it was, you... Sorry. Yeah. No, it, was, it was through English literature. Yeah. Now go on. It was through English literature that I ended up where I am now, basically. Right. Um, did you complete your A-levels? Yes. Um, I completed them all. Yeah. Um, I didn't do great, uh, if yeah. I'm honest. Just, I, yeah, a lot of things happened in sixth form, which kind yeah. of took my concentration elsewhere. And um, <laughs> I, d- I did, I was, uh, yeah, it was okay. I did all right. I just didn't do as well as I thought I would do. Um, and, but and I still thought I'd go to university. Okay, because I think the thing that really strikes me is um, with the, the A level thing when you know they say you must you must pick subjects they're interested in you must pick subjects that will lead you into you know your future but you're being told well there's no space for you in the class that you want so you can do two topics that you have not picked <laughs> absolutely yeah um, <laughs> for two years <laughs> I kind of thought I kind of thought I thought, I thought history and geography would go together well yeah um, and I always I always loved English it was about yeah. be language or literature but yeah. yeah, the fact that, I mean, now you see coaches going from school to school, taking students to give them exactly what they want and need. Yeah. But yeah, they couldn't just put a chair in another classroom for me to do what no. I wanted to do. Um, but to be honest, I, I loved, actually, I really liked Christian theology. Yeah. And again, it was Christian theology, but we it was all multi-faith. You learned about lots of different faiths. Yeah. And it was a really good um, discussion group, really. It wasn't like... Yeah. We just sat in a classroom and a teacher spoke to us. Um, we had really good open discussions about religion and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was good from that point of view. Yeah. What I was going to do with that, yeah. who knows? You know, right. I don't know. Some become a, a theologian. I don't know, but uh, I don't right. know how many theologians Hollis produced. But uh, there we go. <laughs> um, you said that you thought university was on the cards. So what was the conversations that you were having at home? and at sixth form around what your next steps would be? Again, um, only one of my uncles, at that point when I was in school, only one of my uncles had gone to university, no one else in my family had been. And we're quite a big family. My mum was one one of seven. And pretty much everyone still lived close by. So all of my uncles, aunties, my cousins, no one had gone to university. My uncle was the only one who'd... um, left and gone off and so he was a bit of an inspiration for yeah I want to do that you know that's probably yeah. the route I want to go down also we lived right next to Hull University uh, so every day for 15 16 years yeah I passed Hull University yeah um we passed we passed the student accommodation we passed yeah. the areas where the student lived yeah. I always saw the big red brick buildings and I was, yeah. that was always inspiration that yeah, I can't wait to be seen there. That's what I want to go to, whether it was Hull yeah. or elsewhere. I just thought, yeah, I want to be part of that. Um, and that would be, you know, lead me to whatever career I wanted. I just knew I wanted to go to university. Yeah. Like I said, that just, just didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it was never really put upon us at school that you had to go to university to succeed or to progress in life or anything. Mm-hmm. And Certainly at home, I think my mum would always kind of, you know, say, like, well, you have to study, you have to do this, because then you can go to university. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't remember any really big discussions, even within my friends group, really. I think it was almost a given that we would all go to university. Um, 
maybe that's a school I went to. I don't know. But um, yeah, I think everyone just kind of assumed, yeah, I'll do these, then I'll go to sixth form, and then, then I'll go to university because that's what we have to do to, to progress, really. And, and what was it then that um, caused you to walk in a different direction to whole university? <laughs> yeah, so like I say, um, a few things were going on in sixth form that I just made me think, oh, I'm probably not going to move away to university, but maybe I'll go to Hull University. Okay. But then I think I just left it so late to make a decision that yeah. I actually just ended then going to Hull College. And rather than doing a degree, I just did um, a BTEC national diploma. I don't know if yeah. they're still around. Yeah. Um, in, med- in TV and film production. Huh? And that purely came around because um, a friend and I, so I did English literature. He was doing English language. Yeah. He had to sub- he had to submit a story. Yeah. Um, and he went he went away with some friends for the weekend, and came back. Yeah. And he said, I, I can't type. Can you type the story up for me? So we typed his story up. He had yeah. he handed it in. And for some bizarre reason, we, we just left copies of this story around the sixth form common room. <laughs> yeah. And everyone said, This is a lab like a story. You should make this as a short film. Right. And back in 1997. You know, there was no mobile phones to shoot things on. I had a camcorder, which I think was probably one of the only people I knew with a camcorder. Yeah. Um, I, and me and my friends out of school used to remake, this is bizarre, we used to remake episodes of Bottom. Do yeah. Bottom with Mick Mill? Yeah, I do. It. We're just the so, endless beating each yeah. other with frying pans. Yeah. And, oh, cool. Yeah, and stupid yeah. jokes yeah. and stuff. We used to, for some reason, we used to remake episodes <laughs> between four of us. Yeah. And so people kind of knew that I was into that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, so after our A-level, I just thought, well, yeah, I'll just do that. I'll go and learn how to make a film mm-hmm. and I'll make this film. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like I said, Hull College did a TV and film production course. So I thought, well, I'll start there. Yeah. Um, but then once I started, I was actually quite, still quite into the writing side of it. And I thought mm-hmm. maybe I'll be a journalist or something. And yeah. But yeah, just... So, oh, sorry, I, I don't even know what your question was. <laughs> was, it, was it how I got into <laughs> where we was it just university? Different route. That's right. What, yeah. what caused me to tell that group? So, yeah, so just a weird event of one Monday morning, my friend not being able to type. Yeah. And that led us down this path of um, uh, typing up a film, basically. And were you, when you were recreating Bottom, um, were yeah. you in, in front of the camera or behind it? I was behind it, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we did about four or five episodes. Yeah. And I'm only in one of them. Okay. I think I think I, I liked I liked being behind the camera. As okay. uh, so me and another one of my friends were the two that would film it. Yeah. And um yeah. So uh and, and again all our all our, all our big family holidays, we'd always go there'd probably be between fifteen and twenty years we'd go on family holidays up okay. up and down the east coast and things. And I'd always have the camcorder filming bits and bobs and yeah. just being silly with it and frightening my aunties and things like that jumping did out they, filming does any of that footage still exist it does yeah it's oh. um it's still on a high eight camera uh, yeah. it's lots of tapes and we've yeah. got a few on vhs that i keep meaning to transfer before they degrade too much yeah so yeah wow lots of uh, nice footage of family holidays and stuff yeah yeah and um, once you'd completed your BTEC and you had a, you must have had a body of work. Um, wh- where did you go <laughs> after that? So I always, I loved my time again at Hull College. It was just great. And I'm still friends with, at the time, there's a guy who was like an engineer. And basically, you would book your equipment out with, it's called Lee. Yeah. You would book your equipment out with Lee and he would book your edit suites out for you. Yeah. I'm still friends with him now. He he teaches. He's moved on from Hull College to another college, and he's had me in there as a special kind of speaker, if you like. And yeah. he gets me in to do um, interviews with students, yeah. which is kind of like we still got a great relationship. And he, yeah, he was just uh, a really nice guy. There. So, what was the question again, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> where did you? Sorry, that Monday morning. <laughs> yeah. What? Um. Where yeah, Where sorry. did you go off from? So, once you've got your BTEC, because. Yeah. Um, for many young people, I would imagine you go, right, I want to do this, but I 
imagine, although I don't know, it is difficult to secure your first job contracts, work experience. Absolutely, yeah. So again, so yeah, so when we were there, we kind of, I say we, because there was me and two of my friends who kind of, in the second year, we thought, right, well, when we leave here, we'll start a production company. Just yeah. very, very naively. Well, that's yeah. what we'll do. Um, but what happened was my radio radio production lecturer yeah. was a BBC producer. And mm. we just got on really well. And he actually offered me and one of my friends just some part-time work, just helping him out yeah. on little jobs around Hull. So he was a freelance education producer for the BBC, but he yeah. also did like live live events around Hull and East Yorkshire. Yeah. And so a friend and I just kind of started doing the odd job for him. Yeah. And when we finished, he basically said, look, I've got probably part-time work for you if you're interested. Wow. So we said, yeah, yes, yeah, please. Yeah. So again, our plan, again, I was in two minds. Do I go off and get a degree in this? Yeah. Yeah. Or do I take the opportunity to just start working straight away? Yeah. Um, and I think before we even finished the course, he'd introduced us. We went and did a film in York. Mm. And we got talking to the production company who were filming. So he was, Graham was producing it. Mm. Uh, another company were actually filming it. We got talking to the owner of that company. And he said, you know, his, his words were, yeah. If you go to university in three years' time, you're going to come out with a piece of paper. Yeah. But if you work for us for three years, we've been. That's the guy we're interested in. That's the guy yeah. who's going to have three years of life experience and work experience. Yeah. So you know, go off to university if you want, but we'd be interested in using the guy you know who comes on shoots with us, who learns the ropes. Yeah. So that's that was my decision made. Really, I was working for Graham part time. I was working for another Dave part time. Yeah. I was working at Morrison's, <laughs> um, which I'd started, yeah, part time, obviously, yeah, yeah. and and then yeah, at one point I had four four part time jobs on the go, yeah, because this production, this I just happened to be sat in their office one day at this production company, and a, believe it or not, a private detective rung up and said, "I need a cameraman," right. and they said, "It's not really what we, it's not really what we do," yeah. but hang on a second, <laughs> and uh, wow. they just looked at me and said, "Do you want another? Do you want, some some more work I said yeah, yeah. they yeah. said right I've got I've got some more for you so for about 18 months I was a oh. cameraman for a private detective oh, as well as doing all these other jobs wow so eventually I quit Morrison yeah <laughs> I quit Morrison even though they begged me to stay by offering me a supervised job yeah and I said look you know I appreciate the offer but this is I didn't want to be a security cam private security cameraman but the other two jobs were really taken off I was getting lots of work yeah so I quit Morrison's. Yeah, that's that's quite a big. Uh, uh, I don't know frame of reference. You're like, I'm covertly filming people in one, in one yeah. role. It was a very strange job. Yeah, a very, a very interesting job. Yeah, yeah. but um, uh. but back then, yeah, this was like 2001 probably. Um, wow. The technology wasn't amazing what we were using but um yeah. but interesting really interesting for about 18 months and then I just got sick of it yeah. um and yeah. like I said the, the the actual work proper production work let's call it was taken off so yeah so I quit that job as well okay I thought you know there's, there's lots that I'm curious about on the private investigator work but I don't want to betray any confidence as you know um I, I, you can ask me you can ask me questions but whether I can tell you the answers or not is something else <laughs> Yeah, I'm, um, <laughs> I've just got visions of you like peering around corners in a bush. Yeah, sitting in a car, well, sitting in a car, pretending to read a paper. <laughs> so I was. So it's not too far from that. Okay. I would sit. I would get um, driven into position. So we. Right. So we'd have a target. Let's call them. Yeah. And I'd get. I would drive a white transit van. Yeah. Oh my. To God. maybe a, yeah. a mile, a mile of that house. Yeah. And then I would. I would, next to the passenger seat was a secret door in this transit van. So then I would crawl through this door into the back yeah. of the van. Yeah. One of my other team would then come and move that van into position. Right. And so to anyone looking, they would just see someone get out of that van and walk away. They didn't realize yeah. that I was in the back of that van, you see. <laughs> and I could be in the back of that van for 12 hours. 
oh with God. no sunlight or anything. And what I would have, I don't think this is giving away too much, but in that van was a periscope. Yeah. Okay. So when you see transit vans with that like like white yeah. the fan on top of the yeah yeah I was we had a camera pointing out out of out of there at someone's house or yeah. their driveway, That's and I would head. basically sit there watching them, and then if they left, yeah. I would radio through to the other guys who would then follow them in a car. Right. Wow. So two of the cars would follow them, but I they were the mobile team, I was yeah. the kind of static, boring team really. So I had a Game Boy. A newspaper, yeah, and that was my entertainment. No mobile phones really back then. And Maybe actually, I'd snake up, so I might have snake. Say, so if you're playing Super Mario on a Nintendo, you've got periscopes in that as well. So there's a lovely, uh, yeah, kind of synchronicity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, but as you say, your other production work took off. Yeah, and what what was it like, kind of, for you? How how did you um kind of build your skills where did that lead you in terms of figuring out exactly what you wanted to do within the industry yeah so for so for graham who was my lecturer who i went to work with mm. um he, he didn't have a video company as such he had a an events company if you like okay. um so he brought me on another a friend on board and we kind of built up his built up his video production company mm. so and it put a lot of trust in us straight away really um so within a year or two i was i was kind of directing and production manager if you like so mm. i was having one-on-one -on -one meetings with clients straight away and yeah. arranging shoots and scripting and yeah all kinds of stuff so it was great that he just kind of threw us in at the deep at the deep end really yeah. um but then then with um dave and the company called classly media they'd been a production company for probably 20 odd years at that point okay. and so with him with dave and the rest of the team there i was getting the experience i needed on high-end production really yeah. so yeah. with graham we were kind of quite local building the company up with with yeah. dave and the class lane team they were already working all over the country working in europe mm. so with those guys i started off just as a runner and camera assistant yeah. and then within a few years um you know it was like b camera if you like and then mm -hmm. after a while you get entrusted to be actually you can go on a shoot by yourself and maybe you can direct this and yeah so yeah it's just you just learn on the job really um and dave was right because after three years of doing that with him yeah. I had friends who had gone off to university, were coming out, couldn't get a job, and yeah. were coming to me because they'd, they'd known I'd been doing it for three or four years. And yeah. I tried to point them in the right direction and got a few of them jobs in the industry. But, um, you know, out of, that, out of that media class of probably 30 odd, I think maybe two of us actually got jobs in the industry, really. So, yeah. And that included the people at the university, the ones who went up to university, I don't even think, I don't think any of them are. I work in the industry and that's not to kind of belittle going to university you know that's just the way it was you know maybe the jobs weren't there yeah um, yeah and it's it's interesting what you say because um particularly I guess in in that kind of line of work it is that hands-on practical experience learning from others how to actually do it versus the theory behind it building your network um that's yeah. absolutely it. The first um, few shoots I went on, you know, they'd asked me to set the camera up, and then you just realised, as good as those two years in college were, mm. you just you just learned what you needed to do at college, really. But you didn't. Yeah. The cameras are different, obviously, when you leave college to what they are in the real world. Probably yeah. not as much nowadays. But um, just really simple things. It's like actually, we didn't get taught that in college. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And did people get taught that at university? I don't know, but. Um, but that real life experience was priceless um, and the people I was working with you know two of those guys went on to work all over the country for the BBC which yeah. strange enough I now do so it was weird how yeah. three of us have gone on to do that yeah um, but that grounding that Dave bizarrely there were four Daves in the company <laughs> when I joined <laughs> so um, wow <laughs> so, that, so yeah that was quite strange but so I became I became stubborn in that company 
taking much learning. Um, yeah. you couldn't you couldn't just shout for day. You couldn't shout day and have four people constantly turning on. So the, so yeah. all those I, I started at the bottom there, but each of them teach you different things. You know, we had one of them was really good at editing. So yeah. I learned, or two of them are really good at editing. So you learn the editing side of it yeah. from those guys. Two of them are really good at writing. So you learn writing, the writing side of it. You know, Dave, who ran the company, was an amazing people's person. So you learn how to get on with people on, you know, from different levels. Because we would do, you know, when that company progressed and I worked, I worked for them full time. Mm. Um, and I think I've alluded to the fact that from 2008 up until COVID, we worked all over the world. Yeah we would work with you know literally you know you're working with royalty sometimes you're working with yeah. everything in between you know all walks of life yeah from yeah you know, and again in that industry not that wealth has anything to do with it but certainly within, within our industry people have a very hard time dealing with people who make money i think like that seemed as like if people see i think most people have this but if people are wealthy then they get treated differently Right, and we never, we never, we never did that. You know, it doesn't matter. Who, it doesn't matter who you are. When you yeah. pull up and you have to talk to someone with a camera, yeah, you have to get on their level. You have to make them comfortable. So it doesn't matter yeah. who they are. Yeah. Um, you know what position in life they are, what wealth, how wealthy they are. Just you've just got to get them on board and find yeah. that connection. And that's what I think we were really good at. Um, yeah. that's almost almost as important as any technical um, aspect of, of a shoot is yeah. just get just getting what you need from that people and getting on a level where they feel comfortable. That can yeah. be the CEO. That can be a CEO of a company. It can be models you're working with. It can be some children you're working with. Yeah. You know, you have to make them feel comfortable to make, ultimately make your job easier. And yeah. whatever you're filming, whatever you're filming them for, you know, you want that to turn out the best it can yeah um, well, you could tell when someone's not comfortable yeah. can't you if it looks stilted or Absolutely. awkward it's yeah, yeah. especially with 4k yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah there's all, a lot more detail now yeah yeah which never had before yeah um, so, um one thing i'm conscious of is that and having seen you and your team you know working it's just like the, the physicality and the hours the hours and hours that you would put in so what is it for you that gives you the biggest sort of like yeah that was great yeah I really enjoyed that like where where does that come from in in something that I observe to be really you have to give a lot of energy and a huge amount of time to get to that end product yeah so obviously when when we've worked together um we did some studio work originally a few years ago um and then obviously we did a lot, very large conference together um or yeah. so many um i would have been almost two different people probably in those environments from when we were working one-on-one -on -one together in a studio that's very different to how yeah. i need to be when i've got a team of people yeah um and clients there and lots of and it's yeah. live and there are 500 yeah. plus people there expecting something yeah. um part of that um comes from having that's quite cliche but having a good team so yeah. i always try and make sure you know um ian well this means nothing to anyone listening but <laughs> i know you referenced ian in one of the messages you sent me which is a colleague of mine who was on camera that day but helped you out yeah. with the microphone yeah. we've known each other for well over 10 years yeah. um another one of my team paul we probably worked together for close to 10 years yeah. um it's having the people around you you all know what you need to do Mm. um we're all very similar so like I say it's not so much we all know that we all know what to do technically yeah I know that I can give those guys a piece of equipment a camera or vision mixer whatever it is mm. I know technically they know how to use it and vice versa what is more important in almost every job is could I leave those to help you out if you need help could I let yeah. them meet a client and not embarrass us yeah. <laughs> or do something like that. You know, not not yeah. miss up that relationship you know it's all about yeah. your people skills as well as it is your technical knowledge of how to use the equipment um yeah. and what 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 we have found i always say we've got you know i worked for a company for 23 years so yeah. 
I still work with a lot of freelancers as a team, really, um, yeah. is you, you start trust with each other that we all know what we need to do. And what puts a client at ease more than anything mm-hmm. is not just that they're going to get a great product at the end of it, whether that's a live event that with no glitches mm-hmm. or um, mess, you know, messing up or technical yeah. issues, or whether it's a film that we've spent a few weeks producing with them on location. Um, they, you know, they need to know that we all know what we're doing, and it's about giving them the experience. Lots of people say. We, we we could be on a resort for two weeks and after two weeks mm. the client would say people hardly noticed you were here yeah. because we would just we, we would get there get on with the job get it done yeah. and just try to be as low-key as possible yeah. because it, we always just say it's not about us people would say yeah. oh, we've had film crews on site before and it's they're shutting off this they're blocking this we have people yeah. need to do this but the director's shouting this and that that well if they're doing that, that's because they want to make it about them. You know, right. that director is full, full of their own software and their own self-importance, and they want people to know that they're in charge. Yeah. You know, they like to shout action. They want people to go, oh, he must know what he's doing because he's shouted action really loud. And yeah. he shouts at that camera guy and he's making this girl run around or that camera woman run around. And yeah. They're doing that because they want to show off, basically. Right. For us, we, we like to get there, get the job done, make everyone feel comfortable and that they've had a good time while we've been there and it's not been an issue with us being on site um and that you know we've done that with every every kind of production really it's not just um destination and resort based stuff it's mm. you know if you're in a factory or whatever then yeah. well you don't want to be stopping production lines because right. you need to get your <laughs> shot you know yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. every, you know and especially with people who just like to uh, in a factory it's very um formulaic and people need know yeah. that they go in this is their job and if you go in and mess that up yeah then it throws everyone off you know and so yeah. why make people feel uncomfortable and oh am I going to get blamed for me not getting these chocolate bars packed in time and all yeah. that kind of you know whatever whatever it was so yeah. we've always just like I say going back to the people skills they're the most important side of of it really and and it was, I guess it plays into a question I was going to ask you next, which is if you look at your career, you know, what do you feel has stood you in good stead throughout? Um, I did make some notes, but I, I, I haven't even looked at them, I must admit. <laughs> um, again, I think it's just not being pretentious, I think, would probably be the word I would use. It's I, I've always loved the being the person that, um, work experience students came to yeah. so when we would we would get a lot of work especially in Hull for yeah. maybe 15, 15, 16 years there wasn't many production companies right. there's probably only two or three of us mm. now there's quite a lot because we, we've got City of Culture in 2017 we had yeah. a lot of investment, a lot of business a lot of young startups came around yeah. um, so now there's a lot more on offer but back then there wasn't much You know, I wouldn't know who to have gone to when I was at, at college really yeah. other than the company I ended up working for. So I love being giving the opportunity to people and being that person who helped people understand the industry. And and it can be quite daunting, you know. Yeah. Even yeah. when I go on some shoots now, TV work, it can be quite daunting to see maybe some presenters you've watched on TV for years or yeah. a celebrity you might have to be working with. Yeah. But most most of them just want to be treated normal and yeah most of them i'll say most of them <laughs> want to be treated normal um, i want a basket don't want of puppies yeah 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 so yeah. i think yeah so what studies in good stead is just being honest just being honest and genuine um we always used to laugh because we would be a preferred supplier for an agency in new york mm. and you think why is an agency in new york who has access to thousands of yeah. production companies and thousands of camera ops and directors and writers why are they flying over three or four crew from Hull in England yeah yeah I mean it's because they loved working with us because they knew they'd get a good job but they also knew that our maybe our work ethos and our personalities Mm. they just liked working with people like that genuine people and not just fake people if you like I don't don't like I don't use the word fake but again are they a bit pretentious are they a bit up themselves and they're done it's all about them rather than the product and yeah. I think just because we're a nice, genuine team to work with, that stood us in good stead. Um, and, I actually met, sorry, go on. 
Now go on, you met someone. Who did you meet? No, well, again, this was just a, a local lad who came to us for work experience. Mm. Um, it's just stood out, that's all. And he came to us for work experience. He was fantastic to the point where we actually was going to offer him a job. Mm. Um, but, but his girlfriend got a job down in Selfridges in London. Yeah. And he said, it's her dream job. I'm probably going to move down to London with her. Yeah. Um, but thanks for everything. I really appreciate the fact you're going to offer me a job. And yeah. he went on to work for, this might not mean anything to you, but um, I think it was COP90. It was like a huge oh, YouTube right. channel. He was there from the birth of that. Um, he went on to do great things. And I saw yeah. him a couple of years ago, just walking into a hotel, and he, he was with some Spanish um, director. I said, oh, how are you doing? He went, and he said to this he said to this lady, this is Dave. He taught me everything I know. And it was just real nice that, you know, he'd, he'd gone on to great things, but he still remembered the few weeks and months he had with us um, and appreciated his time with us. And that's, you know, I think that's really nice, actually. I think that says a lot for us, um, yeah. that people remember what we did. Or well, I hope it does anyway. <laughs> I hope... Yeah. Um, I, I, hope, I hope we stood some good people in, in there, you know, directed them down the right path maybe and gave them a good experience that um, I didn't have. And and how was um, how was the experience of going from, as you say, you were employed for a very long time by your production firm to starting out on your own? What what have been your kind of learning from going through that experience? Yeah, that was that was hard. We kind of knew it was on the cards because of because after the first financial crisis in 2008, we'd, we'd put all our eggs in the, this travel basket, let's say. Um, yeah. And it was going fantastic. You know, it was going really well. Um, and when it when COVID hit and we knew that industry wasn't going to survive, really, and mm. the travel industry was going to take a long time to recover. Mm. I knew it was on the cards, but it came at, within a few weeks. I'd just started an extension on the house. Yeah. We were pregnant about... Yeah. A few months, I can't remember how far on we were, but so we were expecting our first child yeah. and then maybe Dundon for the first time. And I, you know, in 22 years, wow. just having that and thinking, right, well, you know, as I said before, we've, we've been very lucky that I've been able to stay in Hull and have the career yeah. that I've had. Yeah. When that went away, it's like, right, well, there's nothing else here. I'm going to have yeah. to move to maybe Manchester, yeah. Leeds, London. Um, and when you've got a child coming, you just started the house. That was quite really daunting, actually. Like, well, what do we yeah. do? But I was really lucky. I think, I think I said that a lot of my close friends who are already freelancers mm. um, just said, look, I can get you in. Mm. Get me in at BBC. So I was yeah. in, in with BBC Hull and Leeds um, yeah. pretty much instantly. And, and breakfast, I had another friend who was on the sports with Sky Sports. Mm. He got me in there. So yeah. I was I was very fortunate Again, it's good that I'd built relationships that people trusted me and wanted to help out in that in that moment to um yeah. to keep that work going. Because it was frightening for a few weeks, you know, just thinking, how much am I going to get redundancy? How long can that yeah. see us through until we've made a decision on are we just going to forget the life we've got here and move away? Yeah. You know, my wife's got a career, obviously. You know, she's got a great career here. Yeah. Do we move for my career? Do I then say, right, well, I'll just change my career which to be fair I spent two months working in a tin factory just oh, to right. keep some money wow. coming in yeah again wow. one of my best mates on the tin making factory and <laughs> he just mentioned he just mentioned oh I've got this job there's a bit of a backlog so I said well yeah. how difficult is it yeah. and he's like oh you serious I said yeah I said yeah I need you know I don't know what's going to happen wow. so wow. after after traveling the world and working in 40 countries for all those years yeah. living an amazing lifestyle I was just like stick me on that conveyor belt and I'll label these tins up for you if that's what I need to do and that's what I need to do um right. wow. but you know luckily <laughs> I didn't have yeah. to do that for too long <laughs> until yeah. everyone, until you know all the other jobs started coming off and and coming in and um but again you know I was just willing to do whatever I needed to do really but um yeah, and I think so, yeah, that plays so, to what you had to say about being, I guess, genuine and not full yeah. of your own self-importance. It's like, right, if I'm going to need to go and work in a factory for a few weeks, then that's Absolutely. what it's going to have to be. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Um, I still don't have a website up and running because I just, 
<laughs> I'm always out doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and it's hard. It's I, I, I did do a course for H, through HMRC or Job Centre yeah. about starting your own business. Yeah. Oh, you need to register on yell.com. I said, well, no one looks for freelance cameraman. Yeah. I certainly would never look on the other pages for freelance cameraman. No. You go through your network. Mm. So it's not about names. Again, back to relationships. It's not about names on a piece of paper. It's about, I remember working with that person. Yeah. They were great. I, you know, yeah. I'll give them a ring, see if um, they've got anything going, that, that kind of thing. And yeah. So, yeah, I still have a website from running. Most of the work in this industry is just word of mouth and relationships, really. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, so, yeah, it was daunting, but it couldn't have come at a better time, to be honest. Yeah, you yeah. know, I, was, I used to essentially work away for two or three weeks, which is probably why I never started a family until quite late. <laughs> but now, now I've been fortunate enough to... <laughs> Yeah. You know, spend time. Yeah. You know, I'm not I'm not having to go to the office and do editing or I'm not in a way on shoots. I can spend yeah. time with my, my son, which I've never had a chance to do before. You know, I'd have been away too much. I've missed yeah. out on so much stuff. So wow. as daunting as it was, it's, it's it's been a bit of a blessing at the same time. Wow. Um <laughs> I was gonna say, and you've probably got some amazing shots as well, plenty of video. Could you just tilt your head that way, son? It's not uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I've got some. Um, I've got some nice pictures of him when yeah. I when when he could just when you could just plonk him down and yeah. he wouldn't move. When I've had yeah. to just get get gear ready and he's just been start looking at all the equipment and um, yeah. now he's big enough to actually you know he'll sit and pan the tripod around and he can look through the camera wow. viewfinder. And, yeah, wow. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because now he may be. I'm hoping things like TikTok and stuff will have died off by the time he's old enough to realize what these things are. Because yeah. otherwise, he might just be on there and mm. wanting that um, fake, fake fame and fortune or whatever. Well, yeah, I guess no, it's going to be an expensive hobby. I guess, you know, equipment doesn't it will. come cheap. <laughs> it doesn't, no. So hopefully, it can use mine for a few more years. It yeah. might still be usable when it's old enough. But um, and, and, yeah. and as a final um, question, I mean, you've been through, like you say, change the house new baby set yourself up freelance um what's next <laughs> who knows um yeah a friend and i have been talking about setting something a bit of a sideline in um in one area of the work we do um that might come off it might not but we're just happy just to plod along and see what happens at the minute um i'm still happy just just doing what i'm doing right now um I get sometimes sometimes I'm flat out for weeks and it's a bit you know relying on my parents my in-laws to look after yeah the, the little boy sometimes I can take the opportunity to just not work for a week or two and know that you know that doesn't matter really um especially in this industry sometimes you have a few quiet months and yeah. um, summer can be quite hard um start of the year can be you know people taking Christmas off and yeah. Certainly when the when the football and the rugby season stop, you think, oh, I've got two or three months now. Yeah. I might need more of the kind of corporate side of stuff in or maybe move try and get a bit more of the news working. Yeah. Um I'm still worrying times, but then one of my friends said, who's done this a lot longer than, than I have on the freelance basis, he said, You just have to learn just have to learn to enjoy those quiet moments really and yeah. appreciate the fact that you can just spend time with your son. You're not think, thinking, right, well, who's coming, who's looking after him today? <laughs> or, yeah. you know, what's my wife doing? Could she look after him? And, you know, yeah. just appreciate the quiet times really and um, not worry too much about where the next job's coming from. Wow. We'll put a link into your LinkedIn profile, uh, into the show yeah. notes, yeah, don't, so people can look don't you up. That's like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I appreciate you coming on the other side of the camera for uh, this yeah. episode. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>